Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. My family and myself were in Colorado on vacation. We were going down to the Phantom Canyon between Florence and Cannon City, Colorado. We were probably five miles into the canyon when we made a curve in the road and I noticed out the right side of the car several cows standing around and a large black furry thing kind of bent a little in the knees walking around the cows. He looked maybe seven to eight feet tall. He was swinging his arms really fast like he was trying to get away in a hurry. I never saw his face as he had his back to me. I was shocked and at first could not really say anything, but about five minutes later I told my dad and he turned around and went back to the place where I saw him. There was nothing there by then except the cows. We drove back a couple of miles and some people were camping, but they were packing up to leave. It was in the afternoon, maybe around 2 p.m. It was a beautiful, clear day. The sun was shining, a little chilly. In the canyon, it is like a mountain on one side, and some places is a large drop-off, but where I saw him, I was only a few feet, maybe 50 feet from the road, and the incline from the road was maybe 2 feet. There were some trees, large boulders, laying around places, all over the canyon, really. And the only other thing were grass and cows. My mom and dad did not believe me for a long time, but a few years after that, they had went back and had heard that someone else had seen such a thing around Colorado and that something had tried to get into someone's house not far from there and that they had found some fur on their back screen door. No one had ever really believed me but I watched a special on Discovery Travel, and they had some researchers on there trying to track Bigfoot sightings in Oklahoma. So it just seemed like we were not bothering it, that it was just trying to get somewhere, kind of like walking briskly but not running. My mom and dad were in the front seat, and I was in the back. They were looking forward toward the mountains, and I was watching out the side of the car for any squirrels, rabbits, bears, mountain lions, or anything I could see. My mom told me a few years later, after I had gotten married and moved away, that there had been some more sightings around Colorado. I don't remember where, and that the back green porch of an old shack that someone lived in, they had found some fur and could not figure out if it was an animal or a human. On to the next one. In Mofat County in Colorado, four of us were bow hunting in the Douglas Mountain area on private property. It was around 3 p.m., and my brother was bugling for elk on a hill about 500 yards away from us. Our youngest sister was with him. Our dad and I were sitting in our vehicle, and our dad began to bugle at my brother. The commotion got a response. We heard an eerie howl that was powerful. In a way, it sounded like a human trying to sound like an elk. The area we were in is miles from other roads and had no other hunters. Neither one of us was making the noise. Our dad got out of the truck as the sound began to draw closer. He saw a dark brown flash of fur in the pinions and cedars. He thought it was an elk at first, but knew the color was wrong. We have hunted all of our lives and knew the sound was not that of an elk. When Dad realized it wasn't an elk, he became very nervous and jumped back in the truck. When my brother and sister returned, we asked them if they heard the same sound, and they said they did. The closest sounds that resemble this are off the Bigfoot website. After the incident, we quickly drove out of the area, and we didn't return to hunt again. On to the next one. I lived in Las Animas County in Colorado, 
with my mother and stepfather in a canyon called San Miguel, which is located along the Raton Ridge on the Colorado-New Mexico border. We lived in a very remote area behind Fisher's Peak near Trinidad, Colorado. I used to have to get up really early to go to school. It was daybreak and our dog was outside barking hysterically. I had never heard her growl or act this way before or after this morning. She was looking into the canyon. I went to our kitchen window, which faced the canyon. I could see something running into the canyon. It was on two legs, tall and covered in hair. It didn't run like a man. It ran as if it was straddling a small rut side to side. I ran down the hall to my parents' room to wake them up so they could see what I was seeing. When they got to the window, it was gone. However, I saw it one last time as it passed between bushes. My parents were only witness to my extreme excitedness and my dog's hystericalness. It was daybreak, so the sun was just rising. It was approximately 5 to 6 a.m. He was in a clearing in a canyon. On to the next one. In Eagle County in Colorado, I was 17 and on a backpacking trip with my family in Grizzly Creek Canyon. It was night and we were sitting around the campfire talking. Suddenly, a foul smell came into the campsite. It smelled like a combination of rotten meat, body odor, and muck. Our dogs went crazy, barking and growling, staring past our campfire behind our tent. You could not see anything. Suddenly, we heard an extremely loud and extremely close vocalization coming from just outside the ring of light made by our fire. The sound was unlike anything we have heard before. It was not a mountain lion or an elk. It's hard to describe the sound. It was guttural and undulating sounding like something was strangling a goat. It vocalized two or three times. Each time, the sound started slow and then built in intensity. My dad grabbed his gun but didn't fire. After a few more minutes, the smell dissipated and the dog calmed down. I have never been more frightened in my life and remember wondering if I would live through the night. The next morning, we explored the area where we felt the sounds were coming from. There was an area of smashed grass behind a large boulder approximately 15 to 20 feet from our tent but nothing else significant. The whole day, I felt uneasy, as if I were being watched or intruding. Earlier, we had taken a long hike downstream. After several hours of hiking, we came to a large clearing of flat rock that jutted out over a fishing hole in the creek. The entire area of this clearing was littered with clothing, some very old that appeared to be from the 70s. Some of the clothes were in the trees, and some were piled around the rock area. It was very creepy. The witnesses were four children, 17, 15, 13, and 7, mother and father, and two dogs who were all sitting around a campfire at night. On earlier trips to the same area with my father, we found abandoned campsites where people left all of their gear, including backpacks and tents. My father and grandfather would both tell stories of having strange experiences there including one incident of my father waking in the middle of the night to see someone standing over his sleeping bag. He was not in a tent. Thinking that it was one of the members of his group taking a bathroom break, he went back to sleep. After questioning his companions the next morning, they all said that they did not leave their sleeping bags all night. When my grandfather would backpack there as a young man, he would describe what he called spirit, walking and hiding in the tall grasses at night. On to the next one. Near Fort Carson at Cheyenne Mountain near NORAD in El Paso. While training at Fort Carson, I was with a Marine Recon Aggressor Force aggressing fire batteries in simulated attacks. My patrol attacked the headquarter company and during the withdrawal, I was separated from my unit. There was plenty of ambient light and I could see my unit across the field and hear them calling for me. They took off, and I figured I could cut through a wooded area and intercept them. 
As I rounded a bend in the trail, a figure stepped out into the trail in front of me. It was about six and a half feet tall, covered in light brown fur, had a large cone-shaped head and large black globe-shaped eyes. The body was muscular with a thin waist and easily discernible definition, and the arms were long, hanging below the level of the hip. The creature stepped out into the trail in the opposite direction, and I had stopped stock still the moment I saw it. It turned and saw me, at which it exhibited a startled reflex, then immediately crouched down and slowly moved sideways off the trail, watching me the entire time. It knelt behind a bush, at which point it became very hard to see. I realized that I was encountering something very few people have the opportunity to see, at only a distance of about 10 feet. It was around 3 a.m., nearly a full moon with a large amount of ambient light. On to the next one. As of September 9, 2004, Richard Lee, 47, of Hobart, King County, had gone hiking alone in the Washington State Wenatchee Okanagan National Forest on a two-day trip. In the area of the Cascades, he planned to explore Colchuck Lake, an area familiar to him from hiking in the wilderness. When Richard set out, the weather was perfect, but the terrain was rugged. During those two days, he used a cell phone to call his brother and let him know all was well. Then, he disappeared. Richard Lee failed to appear at his Hobart home on September 11th. He was reported missing to authorities on September 15th by his wife, who was initially unconcerned when he didn't return home on September 11th. Immediately, searchers began focusing their efforts on Lake Stewart, Colchuck Lake, and Enchantment Lakes to the southwest of Levensworth. The search and rescue effort was complicated by eight inches of snow that fell around the same time. Volunteers from King, Yakima, and Kittitas counties assisted the Chelan County Mountain Rescue crews with the use of three planes from the Department of Transportation. In the end, the search team found Richard's car off the trail along with his campsite to prevent bears from getting to his kit, his sleeping bag, and food were kept in a tree. Unfortunately, nothing else has ever been found relating to Richard Lee. None of his remains, gears, or clothing have ever been found. Lee's camp seemed uncomfortable to some searchers, but they didn't explain why. On to the next one. In June 2014, Karen Sykes, 70, made the trek to Oahai Lake in Mount Rainier National Park. Karen hiked ahead of her partner once they reached snow level at an elevation of about 5,000 feet. She said she would walk a short distance up the trail, then returned. However, she was never seen alive after that. What happened to her? The hiking community in Northwest America was well acquainted with Karen Sykes. In addition to writing for online publications and newspapers, she was also a photographer and wrote a book describing hikes in western Washington. In addition, she authored a popular trail column and produced articles about Washington hikes for the Seattle Times, as well as co-authoring a second book about hikes in the wildflower areas. Additionally, Karen wrote a blog called Karen's Trails, where she shared hiking-related stories, photos, and trail reports. Her close friend Lola Kemp said she is a trail guru, adding that she hiked twice a week and was a climber and scrambler. As part of her research for an article she planned to write, Karen and her boyfriend hiked near or along Ojai Lakes Trail on June 18, 2014. Despite Mount Rainier's 14,000 410 foot height, she had adequate survival gear to camp overnight. Karen took a faster pace than her hiking partner and vanished during the day. According to Greg Johnston, a former outdoors writer, 
for the Seattle Post Intelligencer, Karen was a strong hiker who knew the mountain well. She was the last person anyone would expect to get lost, particularly on Mount Rainier, said Johnston, who commissioned guys to write a weekly hiking column for the newspaper for more than a decade. If anybody can survive it, it's her. She's really tough and really savvy. The area was scoured by six ground crews, two dog teams, and two aircraft. After three days of searching, rescuers located a body in a rocky, steep terrain in an area that was hard to access and not heavily used. Karen had died from hypothermia, according to an autopsy by Pierce County Medical Examiner's Office. It was 40 degrees Fahrenheit in the park when she went missing. Karen's death was caused by heart disease as a secondary cause, but she didn't have any other injuries, so her death was ruled an accident. Although Karen's daughter and friends reported that she was healthy and fit despite the autopsy finding of heart disease, in spite of the well-marked trail, Karen seemed to have become lost. In one moment, Karen was next to her boyfriend. In the next, she was lost. Did Karen suffer from hypothermia or a heart attack? Or did she encounter something so frightening it led her off the trail in an attempt to escape and ultimately in her death? On to the next one. On Thursday, July 1st, 2010, Eric Lewis, 57, of Duval, Washington, went missing while mountain climbing on Mount Rainier. The climbing companions were left to pull up a coil by a butterfly knot after he had unclipped from the rope and disappeared. The search for Eric ended when only his pack was found in a snow cave after he vanished. However, his body remains missing even now after over 10 years. Is it possible that Eric was spooked or killed by someone or something? Or was it that his gear just failed? So far, no one has been able to fully or satisfactorily explain just what happened on Mount Rainier on that fateful day over 10 years ago. Located in Washington, Mount Rainier is 14,411 feet tall and is about 59 miles or 95 kilometers from Seattle and the northeast of Portland, Oregon. It is also known as Tahoma Peak, or Tacoma Peak, Mount Rainier is a large, active stratovolcano in the Cascade Range in the Pacific Northwest. It is the highest mountain in Washington and Cascade Range as a result of the high probability that Mount Rainier will erupt in the near future. It is one of the world's most dangerous volcanoes. As the first access route to Rainier Summit, Gibraltar's ledges were used. Hazards Stephen and Philemon Breacher Van Trump successfully climbed this route in 1870. It has become the standard route on the mountain for winter climbing. This is the route Eric and his companions were climbing that day in 2010, as the three-man team ascended the Gibraltar Ledges route on Mount Rainier in high winds and low visibility. Eric became inexplicably separated from his two climbing companions. On the ledge's route, Don Storm Jr., the climber in the lead, paused and was joined by Trevor Lane, the second climber on the rope. The rope had only a coil and a butterfly knot when they pulled it in at 13,900 feet as they awaited Eric's arrival. The men had glimpsed him on the rope just moments before and searched the slope below him immediately. To make sure Eric had not skirted around them during the search below, the group headed to the summit ridge after thoroughly searching the area beneath. Upon not finding him at the summit ridge, they returned to Camp Muir, the high camp for climbers at 10,200 feet and notified rangers of the incident. A search was immediately organized. A Chinook helicopter flew above Nisqually Ice Falls and Gibraltar Chute where Eric might have ended up. A team of climbers searched those areas. Late in the day of Eric's disappearance, Tom Payne and two mountain guides searched for him at the summit. More than 40 people participated in the search the next day. 
Mountaineering Guide from Rainier Mountaineering Incorporated, Alpine Ascent International, and Olympic Mountain Rescue Volunteers conducted the ground search. The search from the air was conducted by helicopter rangers aboard a military Chinook from Fort Lewis and a commercial helicopter from Northwest Helicopters. Eric's backpack, climbing harness, and snow shovel were found at 13,600 feet, as well as a small snow cave at 13,800 feet. There was no sleeping bag, tent, food, or even a down jacket in the gear Eric carried which was very concerning. As such, he was well equipped to survive on the mountain. Don Storm and Trevor Land performed a thorough search for Eric and retraced their steps. At least that's what they claim. Could they have cut his rope deliberately, perhaps for unknown re reasons? Simon Yates cut his rope during an ascent of the west face of Siloa Grand, which Joe Simpson wrote about in his book and later film Touching the Void. In 1985, while he was climbing the Hayahosh Range in Peru. Simpson fell over the cliff in an accident while roped to Yates, who was forced to cut the rope to keep both climbers from falling. Simpson survived despite having broken bones and being unable to work after crawling out of the snow cave. His escape from death in the Andes was miraculous. The ground was covered in snow, so it should have been easy to find Eric's footprints, but he didn't leave any besides those of his companions. There were no indications that he strayed from the group. The searchers found his climbing gear in an ice cave 200 feet below where he disappeared. Eric Lewis was never located on Mount Rainier despite this extensive search. Questions remain to this day. What could have prompted him to cut himself from the rope? After sheltering in the ice cave, did he suffer from hypothermia? and become confused or disoriented? Or did something scare him into cutting his rope out of pure unbridled fear? Was he trying to commit suicide? Sadly, we will probably never know. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much and until next time, bye!